Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Colin O'Donohoe, aka the World Maestro, to talk about the role of percussion across musical genres in different cultures. Colin, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to get into this. Sure. Why don't we just start with a little bit about a little bit about you and how you sort of gained this knowledge, and then we can hop into um, really what that means, the role of percussion across various cultures. Sure. Well, a little bit on, on me is I am a professional drummer. That's where I got my start. I did go to college and I got a degree in jazz studies. Uh, so I had, by the time I got my, my degree and I had been performing a lot professionally, I felt like I really knew a lot. I thought I was an expert on drums. And uh, one of the things about me is I'm constantly curious. And I think one of the beautiful things about music is if you're constantly curious, there's always lots more <laughs> you can learn. Yeah, really. And I've also very, I'm just naturally interested in history and I was naturally interested in, in cultures and, and the music of those places. So I had started studying um, drums that were beyond the scope of, of the West and the United States. In in undergrad, I, I took uh, djembe lessons with a master drummer from Senegal uh, who generally did sabar drumming. But we started on, on the djembe and just getting tones. And I always, I'm a firm believer, a traditionalist, I don't know, is you need to get a good tone on your instrument and you need to respect the instrument you're playing before you go into the flashy, cool fills and, and amazing little tricks that you can do on a drum, you have to first get to know the drum, get to know the proper way to get a tone out. And if you're lucky enough to find a master and they're patient enough to watch you with your hand shapes and playing to, to get the tones out, then, then you're in a good place. And, you know, it can take six months or more to get a decent tone out of a drum uh, before mm. moving on. So that's that's a little bit about yeah. the kind of how it got started. And I had been raised listening to music from around the world uh, because my father would play music every day and I would just hear lots of stuff. So I may have been a little pre-programmed or pre-wired for this kind of a of a jump. And then after after college, I got even more interested in music, starting with Irish music and Chinese music. And then from there, I just got, I got broader and broader and more curious. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. Uh, so that's, and that was about 20 years ago. So now, you know, now we're in 2020. So, you know, I've had a lot of time to travel around the world to uh, both record and interview musicians that have spent their lives um, focusing on their particular style, on their tradition. And when you just let them talk, and like you're doing with this show, when you let them talk and you hear what they're saying and, and then you hear what they're playing, you know, you, you get a really good idea of, of where they're coming from, why they're playing what they're playing, and why they're not playing something that you think should be there because we always yeah. come into music with our own bias. Uh, and so uh, we have our ears that we've developed over how many years we've been listening to music. So we have things that we kind of, as a listener, want to hear. Um, so it, it's just it's just been a really interesting time. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and just um, two things come to mind there. First, like where you're saying taking, let's say, like you said, six months to get the good a good tone out of a djembe, you kind of take that for granted where it's like, you know, anyone can go and just buy like a, you know, I, and there's nothing against them. I think they're great drums, but like a Remo uh, djembe that you see everyone mm -hmm. has and you just start playing and you think, oh, this sounds good. But there's like with anything, there's, there's masters there that can get these just amazing tones just by moving a little bit and playing it differently. So that's really cool. And then like you said, uh, we have our own biases as, um, in this case, as, as Americans, where uh, for us, our history and our, our culture as drummers really goes back to our origins are really as like jazz musicians and jazz drummers, because that's about, you know, obviously we have marching and we have snare drum, but I'm talking drum set, trap, all that stuff. So that's our history and our origins, but other cultures go back way further and have, as I think we're going to talk about here shortly, the different role really, which is what we're talking about 
as not being so driving and Gene Krupa and, you know, going nuts kind of stuff. It's, it's not all about the drums in many cultures. So exactly. And I think, you know, maybe the easiest launching point for a music that people have probably heard is Irish music because yeah. everyone is Irish on St. Patty's Day at least. So, <laughs> so at least one day a year, they've heard some Irish music and they've probably seen it in some movies. And the Irish drum, the prominent drum in Irish music is called a baron and it's a frame drum and they mm -hmm. have a tipper that is what they call their mallet. And baron players can play very intricate, fast notes uh, with the two ends of their stick they can play six tuplets and they can play they can play them quickly and with the backhand they can change the pitch so it's a pretty cool instrument and it's something that may your listeners may have may have seen or heard before but what they may not know is that the baron is not there like the drum set it's not there to play a bass drum type sound and a snare drum type sound to outline the measure and outline where you are it's to outline the phrasing of the jig or of the reel that you're listening to. Hmm. So it's actually got some similarities to tabla in that the, the drum can change its pitch. So it can match with what the, if it's in the key of G or in the key of D, which are the major ones in, uh, in Irish music, it can, it can outline tonic and dominant. And it can also slide down to do, uh, dominant if it's helping to uh, resolve a chord. So there's things that a baron player can do, and great baron players just do it just by nature. It, it, it just feels so natural that you don't think they're even thinking about, oh, we have to resolve this chord here. <laughs> they yeah. just they just know, ah, okay, we're going back to the top. We should resolve this thing. And and you might hear that baron slide down, and it's it's a cool sound they do. But what they're not doing is they're not going boom, pop, boom, pop. You know, come on, guys, <laughs> come on, let's let's stick with this tempo. Come on, come on. Uh, sure. What they're really doing is they're uh, they're really I don't know maybe third tier in terms of importance. Uh, and so Byron players get lots of dirty looks from the other session players when they start to overstep their bounds and they do start to try to push this groove. I've, I've been performing Irish music for over 10 years, and I've seen plenty of a dirty look going towards the baron player, like, hey, you're doing too much, and then they have to, <laughs> they have to back off a bit. Yeah. So that's, that's one style where you may be even listening to it and you think, you know, why don't we have more of a drum groove? And uh, with Americans, there's been some American bands like Flogging Molly and Dropkick Murphys and stuff that yeah. I think noticed, hey, there's no driving groove here, let's put one in. And then it was wildly successful in America because Americans were also missing that feel. So to make it marketable to Americans, they put drum set in. And granted, those bands are cool. I have, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, in any way trying to disparage. What I'm trying to say is they were, they were pretty creative. They realized the missing thing for their audience. They put it in and yeah. presto, you know, they're, they're, they're very popular and they did it really well. Do people um, not like that though in Ireland? Do they think that's kind of like a uh, I don't I wouldn't call it cultural appropriation. I mean, I guess it kind of is, but do well, they, it is. Yeah. No, I think you're. I think you nailed it. I think it is. It's absolutely that. And do people? I don't know. I've I've been to Ireland enough times. I I don't think that they. I think they see it as kind of a natural evolution of of their music and it and it. You know, it it serves as a gateway. Uh, if people like those bands. You know they're more apt to check out the chieftains or uh, some of the more the very popular groups that have done it in the traditional sense. And even the mm. chieftains are are experimental, but they also play it in a very traditional way. So groups like that, you know, it serves its purpose. It it entertains one group, and it at least gives people that that chance to be a gateway into learning more about the the genuine thing uh or the original thing yeah but that's interesting i'm i'm right i'm in cincinnati i'm right on the border of uh you know right into kentucky and there's tons of bluegrass music around here and it's kind of similar where there's no drums yes blue and bluegrass is the cousin of irish music and exactly great bluegrass music will groove really groove and it has nothing to do with drums. It has to do with the rhythm guitar and yep. the, the other string instruments. And they are bluegrass 
great bluegrass that the players have to be so together and united and together they establish the pulse and it mm-hmm. drives and it's great to listen to it's really fun and you don't even notice that there's no drummer just you know outlining that groove every measure yeah there's like a, a ticka, 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 ticka. i mean and bluegrass players when you see them just like you said playing well together it is like mind-boggling to have these string players just creating such and i don't know it's for me it just for me it, it makes my heart feel great i when you hear great music it just makes you feel really great and uh yeah no drums don't have to be there and as a drummer <laughs> it can be like yeah. wait 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 you mean you don't need me you know i know but, but it's just not right for that uh that style you know yeah. um so so we just don't do it um uh, and so exactly i think bluegrass is a great is a great uh one to bring up yeah i had a uh at my wedding, I had a uh, we had a bluegrass uh, we had a bluegrass band instead of like a traditional band. We had they're here in Cincinnati. They play around the country, the Tillers, um, and there was no lack of dancing. There was no lack of movement, and there was no drums. Yes, so you know, I think we bring that up just to enlighten everyone that that's listening that uh, while drums are ex- exceptionally important in so many styles of music, it's good to always be a listener first as a drummer. The compliments I've gotten in my career, and I think one of the reasons I've been able to have a career for so long, is I'm always first listening. And as any a performer of any instrument, especially styles that aren't all written down, and you just have your part to play, is you have to listen. And you have to listen to what does the music need? What, what can I provide to help that need? So for drummers to listen to bluegrass and realize you can groove without it, it's a nice experience so that you can then take that back and say, okay, so every time I go into a gig, I don't have to assume that I'm the 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 one that's going to just dominate and enforce the time. I may be there as ornamentation. I may be there to enhance an articulation in a, a melodic passage or harmonic uh, chord progression. I might just be there to help with the articulation. I add attack to the chords yep. or I add attack to the melody, but I'm not the melody or I'm not the harmony, but I'm helping to make an ensemble sound. Some of those string instruments or a horn, they might lack the, the sharp attack at the beginning of their notes that we can we can add, we can provide that so that we help create an ensemble sound where our snare drum hitting or our ride cymbal hitting on the bell or something, you know, it it provides a very sharp attack to let the note that they're playing have a even brighter start. And then Mm. as our attack dies down in the sound, the notes are continuing to ring out. Um, So it's just good to go into a situation and be listening and always listening to what the players are doing, to what's working, what's not working, and and just you know be able to lay off if you need to, or if it yeah. needs more, you give it. Um, but you know, just try always entering into your session with that open mind of I'm going to listen, uh, unless they've told you ahead of time we need you to drive this. Yeah. Uh, then then just sure. go in and listen. You know, and and the musicians you're playing with will know if you're listening to them they will know if you're helping them with the phrasing and and if you're say outlining the form and it makes it easier for them to transition from one to the next they will greatly appreciate it and the music overall will benefit the the concert itself or the recording session will just go better so uh i think that's why we're trying to talk about the the role across the world so we can get a better concept of who we are and how we're going to attack our our performing. Absolutely. And and I think just uh, not to derail the conversation at all, but going in a global, you know, looking at this globally too, the, the, so it's kind of, so you said it's pronounced a boron. Is that correct? Yeah. And that's, so that's a frame drum. And I've had, um, I did an episode a way back about um, uh, female drummers. And we talked about how um, there was a lot of old, very like ancient statues of women holding frame drums. And that just kind of let my mind to how the frame drum itself is a very, very uh, ancient drum that is just found all around the world in many different cultures. So it's just kind of cool how 
each culture, like let's say in Ireland, they take it and do their own thing with it. Um, that's just a very neat historical drum. Yes, and you're right. Frame drums are everywhere. I was in Mongolia and I was able to see a, a shaman and the shaman mm. has, has a frame drum that they use and it's a hexagon shape and they're always playing in three. They're always playing and they're playing three because the number three is very significant in their religious and their cultural beliefs. The number three is a sacred number. And cool. so while they're playing this and while it's providing the ambience and the energy for the session and what the shaman's going to do, it's also re it's just really uh, bringing home that three, you know, the number three and it, it's yeah. cool just with that it's little frame cool. drum and, and it's not complicated, but it's extremely important uh, what they're doing. Yeah. What's the stick called? In in Ireland, it's called a tipper. Okay. In Mongolia, I don't know. But oh, in Mongolia, the shaman was using a the leg bone of a woman who had died giving oh. birth. Oh my and God, I don't even know awesome. if that's legal in, in uh, various countries, but that was what they made their... Uh, his uh drumstick out of it oh was oh my god human leg bone yeah wow. it was a little little creepy to me you know i i thought how does he get that if he had to travel or tour i mean it's a human remain can you bring that on your flight uh, i i don't know it was a little but that's what they do and that's what they've been doing uh so sometimes i guess you know even that is something we would never in america consider doing and but to them like the the head or the the drum skin was made from a wolf and oh, each man, each cool. piece of how they did it was meaningful to the performance um so they had this bone and they blessed it or whatever and yeah. and and every ingredient was actually important to the performance mm. uh, yeah. yeah so yeah, a little intense so the frame itself, that that like uh, bit, that make of the drum, that type of drum is very globally universal. But I guess the differences would be what you play it with, be it uh, the tipper in Ireland or uh, a woman's leg bone <laughs> for this example. And yeah. then the skin can be different. Obviously, there's right. different animals. So, um, man, that's cool. And the, so cool. And the drums themselves, as you start to look around the world, uh, drums are in every culture, and they use the elements that are in their natural surroundings. So when you see wooden drums like the djembe, you're going to be in a place that has a natural forest and access to trees. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at clay drums and things up in the Middle East, you know they're more ceramic. They may have used a metal because they don't have trees, so they don't make their drums out of wood. And as you go around the world, you find that they traditionally will use their drums made out of whatever they can find and then it's been like that for a very very long time they haven't changed i mean it if it's mm. not broke you know don't fix it and yeah. i would say another interesting example as we're going into like what drives versus what doesn't if you look at the music in the middle east um, and you look at uh, say turkish style drumming versus their neighbor of iran and, and the persian music where they use a tombek Mm -hmm. And in Turkey, they'll use Dumbek or they call it Darbuka. Um, you start to see some some pretty distinct differences in very close neighbors. The Tombek, while it's very similar, it's uh, has a softer head. The the technique that they use with their fingers is they, I mean, when you watch them, they use all all their fingers on it, and they'll play extremely virtuosic passages with lots of ghost notes. And those notes aren't there to take over the show. Those notes are there to kind of fill in space and to help the articulation of the classical music that's going on around it. It's also used as a contrast. So if there's a singer who's singing very emotionally and expressive with long legato passages, uh, the drum is there to provide the quick notes and the sh and the short notes that that keep the interest of the listener going. Um, it does groove, but it doesn't groove the way you know Americans would think of of a rock band or a hip hop uh, drum loop. Yeah, sure. It doesn't drive like that, but it does provide lift, and it should when it's done well. It should lift that singer. It should support that singer to feel free to just go for it and just 
saying what what's what the song asks of the singer and then the drummer will support you i've got your back you know don't worry yeah. we're gonna we're gonna provide and then in turkey you hear and in arabic music you'll hear more of the some of the very famous drum patterns like the one that goes dum, ka, dum, ka, dum, ka, dum, ka, yeah or dum, dum, chaka, dum, dum, ka, chaka, dum, chaka, dum, dum, ska, ka, ta, ka. and those those are more uh, closely resembling what we would hear in America as, as the drum grooves. And even those, though, you won't hear a real strong backbeat, like, mm-hmm. it, unless you hear the dun ka dun ka dun ka dun ka That one has a has a good uh, feel to it. But the yeah. others are pretty syncopated, but they're, they're a loop, right? They're a two-measure phrase, and that's what's outlining the drum groove uh, for that style, uh, that style of music. And then... You know, you can get into the odd meters of what they're playing, and then at that ca- in those cases, yes, the the drums are grooving. They're outlining that that drum beat. If it's like uh, you know, like in nine eight, yeah. um, then they're definitely they're definitely outlining that phrase, and they're definitely outlining for the listeners and the dancers and whoever. Okay, here's the twos, here's the three. Here's the yeah, twos, here's sure. the three. Um, and provide that lift at the end of a measure of, okay, now we've got three beats. So just remember, you kind of hang on for a second before we go back into the twos. Well, let me ask you real quick as well, like in that world of, you know, like the drummer's doing this and it's a repeated phrase uh, or the percussionist, I should say. I think with a lot of cultures, correct me if I'm wrong, there's also then multiple other percussive instruments on top of it, which help to create a grander sort of like rhythm and feel is that correct like i think of like in in you know brazilian music there's multiple percussionists going is yes. that yeah i was just in in brazil earlier this year for cool. about six weeks i played in the samba drum with some samba schools uh cool. some, some yeah some really decent high level samba schools and, and it was just awesome and uh, when you go to Brazil and you're in say a cafe situation they'll have about four drummers there wow. and and even in the small small gigs and one person could just be on a, a type of a shaker or a gourd that just goes sh- t- 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 you know and then and then you've got like you yeah you've got about four drummers that in America you would say well probably someone's just going to put a loop on and then they'll play their guitar over it uh, yeah. in the cafe because yeah. the cafe doesn't want to pay five people but exactly. in Brazil it's so important to have those five people and they will say it's not right without it. We need someone on this instrument. We need someone on that. It's not extra. It's not just uh, something you can take it or leave it. It has to be there. And like kind of what you alluded to, I think, is each little piece is is important because that's what creates the overall sound. And the overall sound is what they're after. Uh, so people are happy to take the job of, okay, I'll go in there and I'll just be playing on some of go-go bells or I'll be playing mm-hmm. just a, a simpler pattern and someone's got the pandero and they're playing more of the groove. Uh, but we have all these other sounds that, you know, one drum might only play two notes a measure. They might just play a couple eighth notes at the, you know, on the end of four, or they might just play something. But without those little ingredients, it doesn't add up to the vibe and the sound that as a Brazilian they crave and yeah. it would be like having the drummer okay yeah you can play this show tonight but you can't use your hi-hat exactly uh, yeah we wouldn't know what to I, do right yeah, i'd say no i'm <laughs> I need my, take my floor tom <laughs> yeah like come on that's an essential piece of what we're using you know so if you were to say yeah your band can have the gig but you have to axe two players that would be like it's, asking us to get rid of yeah. like snare drum and hi-hat i mean what else i mean we can kind of do it but yeah but it's not the same and no so brazil is known for i mean that is that is their culture but in talking about going back to uh like iran and turkey and the arabic kind of countries are there multiple percussionists in that scenario as well from what i've seen and and i've been living there in turkey uh off and on since 2017 from what i've seen is it's not it's not okay. exactly as similar as what is what Brazil. I mean, they're happy having a doombeck player or a percussionist. They don't need multiple layers, uh, but yeah, that's probably it. because the doombeck is already the driving force. And also, 
even though it's a driving force in their music, it's still not the main thing. The main thing is more the kanun, uh, the balama, and the the singer, and and all of those instruments are very percussive already. Uh, the kanun is a percussion instrument. It's like the inside of a piano, and it's being plucked. Uh, and then the 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 balama, which is kind, it's a lute. Um, they're playing in a very percussive way. So those are already taking over some of the jobs that a drummer would have. Hmm. And so that's why you know you can be a little bit uh, more, I guess, still in the background, but providing that pulse. And interesting culturally you have to also be open to the fact that the pulse or that groove, it's not equally important in every piece of the world. Uh, Groove is something that Americans, uh, we feel is is probably one of the, if not the most important thing in the tune is the groove. Uh, But that's not the case everywhere. Um, And then Mm -hmm. sometimes the music is even, you know, it can it can speed up and it can it uses rubato. Sometimes it's a little faster, and then it's going to slow down, and then it may slow down more, and that's okay. It's a natural flow of the piece, so it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, set to a click track because it's going to drop. It's going to go up. Um, so, it, so it's also just important not only the role of are we an ornament or are we the driver. But also, how important is that groove? How important is it to establish the tempo and stay at that tempo? Uh, and then, is it acceptable to speed up? Is it actually desirable to speed up? Uh, sometimes music uh, forms, they want to speed up at a certain point. And that's something in America, anyway, for me, I was trained never to do that. Sure. And, when I, and when I do speed up, you know, you get smacked across the back of the hand, right? With a ruler. Yeah. You know, don't do that. But exactly. there's other places Unless it's- where- very very determined and you're doing it like a tempo map and it's like all right we're going to speed up four bpm here and then down and it's very unnatural uh in a way right and the listeners remember it's always about the audience you're you're writing a music for an audience so th- if the audience is expecting it then that's what we provide and and because and they only expect it because the other masters have done it that way so when we're in a genre we're we're not in a vacuum we're there with all of our peers the people that came before us the people that are playing now and so it's also what's appropriate for who you're playing for yeah yeah very interesting um I find that like, and, and it makes you feel kind of like uh, like it questions your your talent when like for me I'm listening to music from a different culture where clearly it's not the same pulse that we use and I'm trying to bob my head and I'm like, why can't I figure this out? And it's, I guess it's just because it's not what we're used to and it's not counting in the same way. And it, this might be a stupid question, but do people like, let's say in Iran or, um, or in Turkey, wherever, are, are they counting it as they go? Or, you know, sometimes I feel like people view things almost as patterns. I'm really it, glad you're asking this it's a really awesome educated question and yeah. uh and it's something Thank i've you. been yeah so <laughs> i really appreciate the question um so the short answer is no they don't all count it the same they don't all think of it the same and actually just to go a little further they actually they think about it quite differently um now you're talking about people that were raised from birth no matter who their parents were, no matter what their jobs of their parents, um, they were raised hearing these odd meters. Yeah. And they were raised hearing the best, you know, the the most famous artists who had with them the best sidemen. And so when they hear it, they are taking a few steps back and they hear it as a phrase, as an overall phrase. And the first gigs I had playing Turkish music on Dar- Darbuka, Dumbek, uh, straight out of college, I was playing in this Turkish uh, ensemble in America, in Arizona. And I was on stage and, you know, I was always taught to subdivide, right? Yeah. Subdivide, sure. subdivide, subdivide, and, and you'll be right. And I always look at the music as groups of two and groups of three. So when you're in odd meters, if you're in 10-8, it's a group of three and a two and a two and a three exactly, or, yeah. you know, something like that. Right. So sure. 
So I'm up on stage and I'm tapping my foot, pop, 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 right? And the bottom up player, who is a good friend of mine, he slaps me on the shoulder. It's a small stage. And he says, for the love of God, stop tapping your foot. He said, you have to, he's like, I don't care if you stop playing, but just listen and when you can feel it, you can join us again. And this is on stage. There's people dancing only a few <laughs> feet away from us. Oh, and wow. as a and I've got a degree. I've got all these accolades, and and it's very humbling. But I did exactly what he said. I just stopped. I stopped tapping yeah. my foot. I stopped playing the darbuka, and I listened. And what I realized uh, from listening is, oh, there's an overall beautiful phrase built in and if i can follow that i don't have to tap my foot on every single eighth note i can play and trust my ear and trust the song to be able to play where it's a two and where it's a three and when i came back in i played instantly i'd say twice as good five times as good as i had been just a few minutes earlier and i didn't have to tap my foot like a nervous rabbit yeah. um, so so when the west meets the east or or the mid east we we bring with us what worked for us in the past. And so what worked for me in the past was, okay, if I'm subdividing, then I know I'm, I'm on it and I'm accurate. But what they do, if they have, let's, let's talk about nine, eight. So if they have a two, 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 three, they don't think two, 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 three. They might think in a group of four and then in a group of five. And they may not articulate the ones every time. So if it's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. For them, the one doesn't always mean the most important dominant note of, uh, it's not the beginning always of, of yeah, the phrase, right. Sure. right? So it might be that the twos are actually more important and that the twos, you know, if you have the group of four going into the group of five, that, that fourth note might actually be the most important note. And you play that because that's what the balama or that's what another instrument is playing and that's what's the lift uh, or the or the signal to the rest of the band, we're changing chords right now on the next beat. It's mm. similar to drum fills, where we'll play a drum fill on the fourth measure going into the next you know downbeat of a new phrase. Yeah, sure. Um, but they might do it in a microcosmic way of within the measure, they're articulating a certain eighth note, and they're doing it on purpose because it's telling the rest of the group, okay, now we're changing to a new chord right here, or we're moving up, you know, they'll use makams. So we're moving in the makam. Now we're not here, and now we're using this as our tonal center. So the drummers have to be a little bit more uh, tuned into theory, I guess, uh, and have a little bit better ear training in terms of the harmonic progressions, the pitches, and even the use of the scale or the makam within the music. You, you start to have to know more than just what time signature the piece is in. You also yeah. have to know what makam, because the makams have rules to them. And so you might have to know, okay, we're going to be moving from this to this. And so it takes a little bit more knowledge than just where you're counting. But in terms of counting, I've, I, I wish I could say that was the last time someone just kind of <laughs> smacked me on the shoulder and said, stop counting like that. But even just about two years ago in Istanbul, I was with a small group, uh, a couple of balamas and a kaval, and the, the guy said a similar thing to me. He said, well, yeah, you're playing right, but don't accent it there. You want to accent here. Hmm. And and so and it's so not what an American would do. Yeah, uh, really. To us, it sounds wrong, but to them, it sounds wrong when we do it our way. And it's their music, so... So I don't really, wrong. yeah, so I'm wrong. I don't have the <laughs> yeah. clout to tell them uh, that, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm American, so you have to do it my my way. Yeah, so you start to learn phrasing, which goes even deeper into how to play uh, those meters. So, and again, it's the role of the music, the role of the drum. You know, what are we there for? And if we're there in that style of music to enhance uh, the progression of the tune, then that's what we're there for. And yeah. it's a it's a bit like orchestral percussion, right? And orchestral percussion, you're there as the spice and you're there to add some energy from time to time. The timpani may take a, a nice feature and really groove out for a couple measures, but overall it's a color and the composer was using percussion as a color. And that's also a different approach to how we play the drums. Absolutely. You know, it, it's funny too, because um, just speaking of this, of how it comes naturally to people, 
Uh, I had an experience where uh, through my job working as an audio engineer, I was recording a Moroccan singer. Um, his name is Marwan. I'm going to mess up his last name. Hadoui, H-I-D-A-O-U-I. Lives in America, but we were recording a song for him. And um, we had, it was kind of funny. We had a, uh, uh, the producer is in Morocco and was, I had to get him up on FaceTime uh, or Facebook video, whatever it is, up on a screen, and it was like a patching nightmare. But anyway, this song, it was in this rhythm where I'm thinking I'm a drummer, and this is giving me trouble. Like I can never feel when the chorus is about to start, and he nails it every time. And he is a non-drummer singer. I mean, he's the singer, and then you see, so so it's like it's so ingrained in the culture where even the people who aren't the percussionists, who are you know the masters of rhythm, every single person can feel it it seems like in the band where i'm a you know been playing drums for my whole life and i can't get it after listening to this song for three days <laughs> like still like isn't that confused. humbling so it's, yeah it's, it's so very ingrained. humbling um but all it really is is this, it's an indicator to you and to us that there's still more to learn and uh, yeah you have to sometimes you know you need to maybe ask him how he's hearing it or, or how he knows that yeah, and, that's a good um, point. And he'll show you the he'll show you what came right before he entered, uh, in the measures leading up to it. What he heard that made him know he hits it here, and hmm. uh, it's it you know like in Indian uh, music, they'll they don't think in terms of measures. They think in terms of cycles, and there'll hmm. be thirty two beat cycles or sixty four beat cycles, and they make take that 32 beats and break it up into groups of five groups of three a one and then a couple twos and and but it's always coming back down on one at the end of that 32 beat cycle um, and you may wonder how did they know that but they knew that because they started with a plan they started mm -hmm. with we know we're going to do this for this many beats and they know it's going to hit again at this new thing after a cycle is complete and it's a different way of listening and it's not how we've been trained. We've been trained to think in terms of measures, and it's it's kind of nice and and orderly. And you know, we've got our measures and we have our phrases. And in America, the number four is is very important to us. Not only four beats in a measure, but four measure phrases, or you know, twenty eight measures, something that's divisible by four. We know that our phrasings are going to come down somewhere that has something to do with the number four. Yeah. Um, so we can just feel that. And after a while as a drummer, we know exactly when a chorus is going to hit. We know when the drummer is going to play a fill because we can feel those four measure phrases without thinking about it. We just know it feels like we're on the third measure of a phrase. And in some cultures like you know, like in the Moroccan one, like in India, they know where their phrases are too. Their phrases are just very differently shaped than ours. But yeah. the overall concept is the same. They know that they've gonna, they're going to have a phrase. They know that there's going to be a switch at the end of this phrase. And they can feel it because that's what they grew up with. That's what they shed on. That's what they were listening over and over again. And, you know, I, I talk about, yeah, it took me six months to get the decent tones on, on the djembe. But when you talk about tabla, it could take a, a year or more to get yeah. the, the tones that you really want on the tabla. And with the tabla, switching over, I guess, to India for Please, just, a, I, just a moment, yeah. is the, the tabla player has to be educated in the raga uh, that they're going to perform. And when... Us as a as a Western audience, as Americans, listen to the music of India or Iran or Morocco. We take our American ears with us, and and our and our American understanding of theory. You know that a scale is a set of notes, and for us, a scale is really just a set of notes. There's no rules that come with that scale. If we're playing an A major. It doesn't mean at some point in A major, we're going to have to now make D our tonal center for a while, and then mm -hmm. we'll make E our tonal center, and then we're going to go back. So we're not switching from A major up to like D Lydian, and then we're not in uh, E Mixolydian, and then back to A. We're mm -hmm. No, we're just in, in A, probably. But in yeah. a Makam, in a Makam, in a Daska from Iran, from the Makam, uh, Makams, Ragas, Daskas, not only is a is a scale a group of notes, 
depending on the raga itself, it's also a bit of a set of rules. They're going to start on this one tonal center. At some point, they're going to use the third as their new tonal center. And from the tabla's perspective, tabla has to be tuned, and they will tune their their tablas up to to the raga itself. And then because they can slide on their, they can make those doom, you know, those yeah. nice sliding notes. Yeah. They can they can uh, very beautifully uh, give the the roots, or they can give the the notes that are in that raga, and they have to move with the raga as well. So they're mm-hmm. not only are they outlining a rhythmic phrase and okay here's the chorus uh, because it's not like that that's not their form what they do is yes they'll outline that they're at the end of their 32 beat cycle and they're going into the new one but also if it's a new part of the makam then they have to change with the makam i'm sorry raga uh, then they'll have to change to the, with their rag up to that new tonal center and outline that and i want to just before we go on, can you, and you had, you said Raga and then other descriptors for other countries. Can you define what a Raga is? So we're all on the same page. Oh, I don't think I can, but I can tell you that, uh, so a Raga is a, is a scale, um, and you'll have different ones or Rags, R-A-A-G. And so it's a scale. And then within that, you know, there'll be some points of, you know, you're going to go from one up to three, up to five, up to four, and then back to one. I'm just giving an example of one yeah. possible permutation that they can do. So within that, okay, we know that the the it's almost like a composition in itself too. So it's it just goes beyond being a scale. Um, I'm not by any means an expert on them, but I know enough, <laughs> I guess, to to be able to perform and to be able to enjoy it. Uh, but just know that the major difference between scales and rags or daska or makam is a scale is just the notes. That's it. Okay. It's, it's not any kind of roadmap. It's just that. Whereas in other cultures, the makam may, may and often is also a roadmap. Okay, we're in this one, it behaves this way. So it's almost a compositional layout as well as a scale. Gotcha. You know, when I googled it real quick, it's funny because it says it has no direct translation to concepts in the classical European music tradition. But it says uh, it's a melodic framework for improvisation akin to a melodic mode in Indian classical music. So that's kind of the that's what you said, basically, but it's kind of funny that you were like, I don't think I can explain it because it seems like it's it's like we don't have it. It's too tough. Yeah, it's it's tough to translate that one. Uh, okay. It's kind of like when you learn another language and you hear this word for something, we don't have that word exactly in our language uh, or vice versa. You know, they don't have a phrase we have in their language. Um, it's kind of like that, you know, so I tried to just give the overall as simplest uh, you know, explanation as possible is when when you see a C major scale, you can do anything you want with that. But when you get rags, you can't. There, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're going to be respectful and do it the way it's meant to be, then you have to also understand the other rules that come with the selection of notes. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So we've talked about Ireland, Iran, Turkey, and uh, other Arabic kind of areas around there, and India now. I think it'd be cool to maybe uh, talk a little bit about if you have, you know, some some insight on it. Like maybe we go to Africa a little bit. There's a lot of, I mean, that's the home of pretty right. much all of everything. So maybe we should sure. take a trip to Africa. Why not? I mean, if we're talking about drums, we kind of have to yeah. uh, talk about Africa. Now, in Africa, the the knowledge that I have, and after the research and the performing I've done, is I can tell you two of the major styles of drumming that. Africa has given to the rest of the world is the music that has influenced the Arab music uh, in the very northern parts of Africa, and then the Western uh, African styles, which are more, I guess, prevalent in our Western world, um, and mainly because of slave trade, and because Western Africans are the ones that came to our country, as well as South America, and well, the Americas overall. So, let's see. So, when we talk about 
uh, Africa. Let's let's do West Africa first. Um, now their drums, first of all, are are sacred to them. Uh, the drummers, when you know, I, I saw from my teacher, he was in Senegal, and he had to get the blessing of of the chief in the town to be able to even consider using this one tree to make his drum. So they get the blessing that it's okay. Then they have to go out and perform a, a ceremony and basically ask the tree if it's okay to make a drum out of it. And then they have to wait. And if the result is positive, then yes, they can cut it down. They can make their drum. If it turns out it was negative, then they believe there's bad spirit in that drum or that in that mm. tree. And wow. it's not meant to be cut down. It's not meant to be used as a drum. So they take it. I mean, you were talking about Remo earlier and their products are fine. I have no problem with with the Remo stuff, but can you imagine Americans having to go ask for permission of the tree and be respectful of the tree first? No, we would just chop it down and make our drum. I mean, we, it's just, I'm not saying we're bad, but no. it's just not part of our, <laughs> yeah, but you're right. not yeah. part of our culture. We would just yeah. chop it down and say, wow, that's some beautiful Oak. I could really use that to make some stuff or that's a great maple tree. Yeah. Let's cut yeah. it down. Um, so they, they have to do that first. And then, yeah, to get tones that are correct for them, they spend a lot of time on their tones. And we, you know, if you're if you're just watching a YouTube video on it, you wouldn't really notice those things, um, the tone they're making, the the sounds that they're making. Um, but but they are. And now uh, they have different calls and and things that really have have carried over into America and to where we have rhythmic cadences. And a rhythmic cadence that'll mean it's the end of the phrase and we're going to go into this new thing. And they've been doing that for a very, very long time, that they'll use these rhythmic cadences to to be the cue that we're moving into mm. a new part. And it's also so closely uh, attached and related to dance. So, you know, the drummers are important and they're driving the thing. But even then, they're studying the dancers. And yeah, they sure. they know the dance. And so they're taking their cues from the dancers. So if the dancers extend a phrase, then in real time, they have to make the decision to keep on one thing and, and watch. And they'll give the cadence when they tell the dancers are ready to move to that next section. Uh, when when I'm looking at backbeats and, you know, in America, the, the groove and the drum beat, it's very much, uh, it's very much come from the West African rhythms, their approach to groove, uh, their approach to low notes being on the downbeats, and then their higher pitches being on a backbeat. So you'll hear those high those high hits uh, coming in where you would now hear a snare drum. And you'll have those nice open tones where now um, in America it's been translated into playing our bass drum. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then with and then in addition to that they they'll elevate the drum so they get that nice um, open tone. If you put your drum down on the ground, you get, you know, the sound won't escape and you don't get those nice bass drum tones out of it. So, and then they'll even control the angle. Sometimes they want a little bit of the drum sound muted, but they want a little bit of the air to escape. So they'll even affect the bass drum sound based on the angle on the floor that they're moving their drum to. Uh, so when we're talking grooves, even, you know, grooves of South America, those things are based off of things that we've heard uh, from field research and, and things, uh, ethnomusicologists that have been studying um, the unadulterated, right, music of, of these areas yeah. and these little towns, these little villages and what they're playing. And thankfully, there still are some of those villages that have not been uh, affected by having to groove to a hip hop beat or a drum beat uh, in four yeah. four, and then they have to yeah. change who they are to fit what we are. So, uh, and that's a that is a real problem across the world. Is in many of these countries, they are changing their rhythms and their pr practice to match uh, dance music and, mm -hmm. and Western music. So that's the Western Africa, Northern Africa. Uh, you'll you know, and places that are not wood dominant, you'll hear Igbo drums, and you'll start to see uh, like the Doombek, the Darbuka, the, I would say the first drum set is the Doombek, because it's got the nice bass drum sound, it's got the little mids that would be a hi-hat, it's got that nice sharp smack that gives it a snare drum sound, and you can carry it with you anywhere, so it's made yeah, its way sure. 
it's made its way from Africa all the way to the Far East, and you see it in Chinese music. There'll be doombecks in parts of China. Um, and, and the interesting thing there is, however it made its way from Africa to China, when China's playing the pieces that use doombeck, they're often in odd meters. Uh, there's odd meter music in China that plays in seven, and it's outlined by the drum. So that's kind of a cool thing when you see why, you know, you ask yourself, why is Chinese music doing this? But you follow the Silk Road and, oh, it's because it, <laughs> the music had many conversations before it made its way finally to China. And then the Chinese took it and they made it culturally appropriate for them. So then they took it and thought, well, how can we make it sound Chinese and not like it's, you know, uh, from somewhere else? So, yeah. so. So I would say when you're going from Africa, it's really taken two two routes as far as the influence it's it's given. Yeah, that's fascinating too, because like you said, it goes to China. Obviously, it it ends up in America, and jazz is you know created. But um, I don't know why, but I think of it, it's really cool how you said it, it made its way to China, and they took it and did their own thing with it. Because for some odd reason, I just think of China maybe because traditionally. It's seen kind of as a closed off country. Maybe that's more of a modern look where it's kind of closed off um, from things in certain ways like the Internet and all that. But um, and I hope that's not a naive statement, but um, it's cool to know that Africa inf influenced music in China. I never really would have thought about that. Well, yeah, it took many, uh, tr you know, it took a while to get there. But yes, yeah. when you look at the origins of where these things came from so much of it can be traced all the way back to Africa. A lot of our rhythms are the homeland is Africa and the continent because there's different drums and there's different percussion coming out of Africa, and including our marimbas and our, our mallet instruments, you know, the traditional bellophone in like uh, Burkina Faso and areas like that. Th those bellophones became marimbas and, uh, and, Sadly, along the way, they lost their microtones because there's, you know, when we think of microtonal music, and I know we're a drum drum thing, but with microtones, uh, we think of, Ara I think of Arabic music. I do too, uh, mainly. Yeah. And I don't think of African music, but the Africans use those microtones also. It's just that they use them in a very different way. And they, it's funny, I, like in Turkish music, they make the microtones to make their music even more sad. They enhance mm -hmm. the dark the darkness of the microtones. In Africa, when you hear music like Tumani Diabate and uh, others, they're using microtones, but they're making it even prettier, even happier, uh, by using just a little bit longer of an interval than what they would have if they were stuck on just the 12 tone. Uh, and as these bellophones made its way into Europe and, and into America, we just kind of you know got rid of the microtone notes and stuck with the, uh, the 12 notes. Yeah, yeah. Now, and I think it should be said that, like, obviously we're comparing a lot of what we have to the American music and saying, oh, this is this way, this is this way. I want to be perfectly clear to everyone, and I'm sure you feel the same way, that there is some great American music. There is great, it's not bad to have things be on the pulse and, the, you, know, the, you know, the two and the four, and um, it's just different. So that's... Oh, I don't mean to try to no, make a you, thesis about American music being bad at all. I, of course I'm not. American. I, yeah. you know, I was raised in playing rock and listening to hip hop <laughs> exactly. and playing jazz. Yeah. I grew up in Rochester. I went to the Eastman School of Music's programs to learn jazz. And uh, no, absolutely, there's nothing totally. wrong or bad figured. about the groove. <laughs> yeah. All, say all that, I'm trying yeah. to say is it's not the only thing that exists. Exactly. And, and I think when we're in America, we tend to think it's the only approach, it's the only use of drums. Yeah. I'm just trying to say there's more we can do. And as Americans, one, one thing I did when I was in, in undergrad was I got a job being an accompanist for dancers, doing yeah. modern dance, doing ballet, and, and everything in between. And I would say as a drummer, it's a great experience to go and accompany classes because you start to you start to realize what can I give to this experience? What colors do they need? What other maybe splash symbol or little chimes or something I need to bring next time to make it really just full? And, and you start to realize that, yes, your job 
being an accompanist is to make sure that they can count. Yeah, um, sure. but it's but it goes beyond that then, and you can start to experiment with colors, and you can do that right here in America, just playing with people, uh, and especially with dancers. If I mean, we kind of sometimes we forget, you know, music in in almost every part of the world, dance is 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 its its marriage partner. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, the, regardless of the time meter and all that stuff, there's dances in all those time meters too. And and so if we can, as drummers, just get a time to just watch dance and try to connect with that, it's generally an experience and a experiment we don't always do. But I would say it could really change how, how you approach your own drumming. Absolutely. And I mean, you uh, not too long ago, most drummers were tap dancers. You know, you've got little Steve Gadd uh, tap dancing on the Mickey Mouse Club and you've got Buddy Rich tap dancing and you've got all these guys. It was, it, it is dance. I mean, that's, that's why we, um, that's why we do it. So now as we're getting close to the end here, you, bringing this all to 2020, you said that, that a lot of the cultures in the world are trying to force their style into the Western, you know, dance kind of just regular four, four patterns but that's not everywhere, right? There's still there's still hope for these cultures to um, keep their their heritage alive, right? Oh, there's always hope, and there's there's always a chance. It's just that American music has been has become so dominant around the world that you know I see it as like a benevolent imperialism or an unintentional imperialism that uh, people really. They love America for all its good and all its bad and all the complaining we do here. People still love America and the idea of America. And so America is cool. New York City is cool, no matter Mm -hmm. where you live in the world. And so, yeah, you're going to want to be cool too. And so it's more like you want to be accepted by them. So you might sure. you might feel like you don't look American or you don't sound American, but what can I do to sound a bit more American? And and also remember music's always about the audience and if the audience is all listening to American music and that's the cool exotic, you know, in music of their of their country, then you want to be cool and exotic also. So you're Mm going to try to be the expert on American music and you'll get more gigs. And a lot of it just comes down to musicians. We all need to make a living. We need to pay our bills, raise our kids. And so we're going to do things sometimes out of a necessity more than a desire. Uh, And then it's a slippery slope because once you've gone down there and you've started to, like I said, the bellophones lost its microtones, some of the other music will lose it too because they they know it doesn't sound right uh, for a Western style of music. So I would say, yes, there's hope, but I would also say there's a, a very large energy that's uh, a momentum, really, of um, of our music making a dominant impression in all the continents uh, around the world. Hmm. Interesting. Well, hopefully um, doing what we're doing here today and kind of talking about it can be a, um, a great source of information for people to look into the uh the more accurate um historical um you know representation of this music um and i think that's a good segue to kind of get into uh as we wrap up a little bit more about you um you are the world maestro so um why don't you tell us about what you've got going on right now where people can find you. Um, let's pretend that the world isn't completely shut down um, as far as gigs and all that stuff. And in a normal scenario, what what what's your uh, what you've got going on? Well, before the pandemic, uh, I had been traveling quite extensively, and I run a group called the Pangean Orchestra. And the Pangean Orchestra is a ensemble where we bring in instruments and musicians from around the world. We unite uh, in the practice rooms and on stage all together, mm-hmm. uh, because we at the front of at the forefront of what we do is we believe in the exchange in the practice room between instruments that don't normally play together. Uh, so we get a better vibe and a better feeling of who we are individually and and what the other person can do. So there's a lot of learning that goes on from the musician standpoint in those practice rooms. And that's kind of where the magic happens. Uh, so I, I run that, but because I run that, I feel a responsibility to better understand the cultures and the music. So I've taken it upon myself to, you know, you put your money where your mouth is and you just go. 
So yeah. Um, so I've been traveling. I've been interviewing uh, musicians in in many countries. I've been playing with them, uh, jamming with them, recording with them when it, you know where we can. And uh, so that's what I've been doing. Now the pandemic came, and uh, the other part of what I do professionally is I write music for television. Hmm. And at the time, I'd say March, April. I wanted to create my own project uh, and take the skills that I had learned both as world maestro and as the the guy who writes your cues for some of your shows in the background, yeah. and and create my own project. I also play Native American flutes, and I've I've taken my Native American flutes around the world with me, and uh, so that that's just something I love and and I do. So. I created a project called the Prayer Garden, which really started in Mongolia. I was in, uh, I had taken a trip into the Gobi Desert, and we had spent some time there. And I did some recording for myself, and uh, the vibe that I had gotten there, and the overall experience. I wanted to bring that and somehow present it. So I came up with that idea, the Prayer Garden, and I worked uh, very extensively just alongside my wife, Jaren, who helped to create a stage setup and a performance space within our own house that could, you know, get off this nice, chill, ambient, meditative vibe. Yeah. And from there, I used some sounds and soundscape design that I had been learning from, from writing for TV. And then I started doing some live streams where I would put on that music and play along to it. It got, oh, I also played space drum or the hand pan uh, in there too, uh, I'm a trained percussionist and I got this drum and you can't help but really feel peaceful and happy when you're playing on those drums. It's yeah, it's just definitely. really fun to play them. And hmm. so I wanted to make I wanted to use those drums and make it melodic and make it a pretty melody and things. So along with playing some virtuosic little, you know, fast notes too cuz I am a drummer. Come on. Yeah, we <laughs> so, have to show off. <laughs> yeah, you know, once in a while you can only yeah. su- you can only suppress that for so long and then you just got to yeah. bust out with some notes and make everyone go, "Wow, you yeah, can play this fast." <laughs> yeah, so you, you know, you got to little got a little put put a little sizzle on there. Definitely. Uh, so we've got this prayer garden project that we're really proud of, really excited about. We've started to release some singles for that. The album comes out in October on the 16th. And for right now, I feel really good about the music I'm creating for the Prayer Garden. If people want to find out about me, worldmaestro.com is the the best site to go to and check out the different projects I'm working on. And, uh, you know, I also released a, a track of Amazing Grace a few weeks ago with a real choir. And cool. uh, it was it's in seven. We changed the the melody from the major pentatonic to a minor and just played with the vibe. We have this bass line that it was inspired by Footprints, really. Uh, You know, if you know that track, Wayne Shorter wrote. But uh, yeah, so that nice, cool bass line is our our anchor, you know, and then we just went with it. And we have, oh, a great jazz guitarist, Chris Champion, uh, plays guitar on there. And so that was fun. So we've got cool Busy projects man. yeah so we've got cool projects going on i'm working on an online course on composition and songwriting with an la songwriter who's had a lot of hits and a, a hip-hop lyricist so we're we'll be giving students a, a very overall approach to creation of music from the hip-hop world from pop music and then i'm brought in as more the classical theoretical guy with with that knowledge and trying to give an overall course that can, you know, help people from many different angles. So mm. those are the projects I'm working on. And yeah, worldmaestro.com has got to be the best place to stay, stay up yeah. to date and follow me on Instagram at world maestro as well. And, and you'll, you'll know what's going on there. Cool. Well, um, I am just beyond happy with, with the, everything that came out in this episode, because it's just such a, I love the unique, topics like this where it's like i said it's different than just the uh the company histories which i love but this is really um just rare information um so and i want to you know obviously i'm sure you do too give a shout out to your wife jaren who's been kind of helping to um coordinate this with me and um get us set up and everything so that's she's i love it when people are professional and make it easy so that's a big thank you to her um absolutely Man, well, Colin, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Again, everyone, it's Colin O'Donohoe, um, worldmaestro.com. 
Colin, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for for this and for it's just a great topic and not everyone asks me on a show to talk about this. It's pretty rare, so it's pretty special that you have this and you have this opportunity. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Colin. All right. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound podcast. <laughs>